Thank you, everybody. Uh, so I will start my PowerPoint now and I'm going to set my timer because I want to make sure that I have time to actually talk about the music. So just a quick um, note. Uh, we are going to be talking about race and racism as a global phenomenon through music and through um, uh, theory, uh, political theory. So there will be some explicit language, um, explicit racial language later on. Uh, but it is important for understanding narratives of black citizenship through music, particularly through music uh, uh, ideas about about uh, uh, about music and classical music. So the title for today, or what I want to talk about, is hegemony and counter hegemony in thought about international relations, political theory, and music. And so I have a variety of goals. One, I want to talk about the white racial frame in political thought, particularly in ideas about international relations and in cultural practices, including but not limited to music and how that has shaped narratives of black citizenship in thought and in practice. I want to then talk about a, an emergence of a counter hegemonic um, uh, um, school of thought called pan-Africanism in international relations and how that has been tied to the emergence of what is called rebel music, for example, in the Anglo-Caribbean as a counterpoint to the narratives of black citizenship in canonical IR theory and in canonical musical knowledge. And the bigger importance about this is that there's been a lot of discussion about decolonizing knowledge. And when we think about decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production, it's important to pay attention not only to forms of music that are forms of knowledge that are produced in academic bodies of, of thought, but also forms of knowledge that are produced in non-academic forms, such as through music. All right, so just a quick, uh, a quick definition what the white racial frame is. So I'm using a definition that comes from the uh, sociologist Fegan, and that was then referenced by uh, Philip Ewell, who's a musical theorist. And so the white racial frame is a worldview that, that uses, quote, a broad and persisting set of racial stereotypes, prejudices, ideologies, images, interpretations, and narratives, end quote, that center the white experience and form the basis of canonical knowledge production. So it is, a, it is essentially a framework based on the idea that, um, that, that white knowledge is legitimate knowledge. I came to this as an IR scholar, and so an IR, uh, international relations, which I, I'm going to say IR every once in a while, is uh, basically a field of political science that um, seeks to answer the big questions, quote unquote, about how the world works, right? And um, uh, the, con the canon of the field um, explains the big picture, and there's a lot of variation in IR, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but the canon of the field explains the big picture through looking at the behavior of sovereign nation states, looking at things like um, formation of international institutions, for instance, right? Um, canonically, the field does trace its origins back um, to Machiavelli, to Hobbes, to Thucydides, who was writing in about 450 uh, before the Common Era, but it became organized into a coherent field as a school of thought, you know, international relations as a field in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, what's interesting about IR as a field is that when it started, it was explicitly organized around ideas about race and concerns about, um, you know, uh, whether or not the white race would retain racial hegemony. And the very first um, journal, uh, academic journal on international relations was titled the Journal of Race Development, which was formed in 1910. They then renamed that journal in 1922. And so many of you probably know it as Foreign Affairs. If you've ever read Foreign Affairs Journal, it started off as a journal of race development. And the focus on the nation state for IR scholars was also explicitly racialized. So... Um, the, uh, the, the, the school of thought was developed during the period of imperialism and colonialism, right, late 19th, early 20th century. And the, uh, the ideas behind canonical IR scholars was that the imposition and the creation of the nation state um, demonstrated the political and cultural superiority of 
the white race. So Paul Reinch, for instance, um, said that the, the, the imposition of the nation state on the colonized territories was, quote, the natural triumph of stronger societies. Carl Schmitt, the German um, uh, kind of uh, proto-realist, said that, quote, people and countries unable to form, forge the organizational apparatus characteristic of the modern state, missing state right there, are uncivilized. And Woodrow Wilson, another canonical IR scholar, said that self-government requires a race able to submit to law and authority. Now, I highlight the importance of race to the emergence of canonical IR and the, the, the study of the state in particular, because if any of you have studied IR uh, in the, you know, since uh, 1945, <laughs> Um, it's been very silent on the importance of race to the emergence of the field, even though race was central to the development of the field. And so this idea of focusing on the state had certain important um, uh, implications, one of which, of course, is that it justified the imposition of colonialism. So if the state is a center of civilization, then you have people like Woodrow Wilson, for instance, scholar and president, who argue that um, in places where we don't have the state, such as, or, or, or a modern state as in the Philippines, that we, the United States, must ourselves for the present supply that government. And he wrote that in 1908. The League of Nations, which was created after the end of World War I to create peace in international society, has in its charter the statement that places, quote, inhabited by people not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world, should be governed by Europeans, such oversight being, quote, a sacred trust of civilization. So clearly, ideas about the state and these racial ideas in IR theory um, formed an important basis for the rationalization of colonialism and imperialism. Now, um, just very briefly, this meant that previous forms of political organization in in the Americas, in the African continent, in the Asian continent, were now seen as no longer valid forms of organization, even though um, uh, some of the early encounters between Europeans and these systems did in fact see them as legitimate forms of, of uh, political authority, right? So you could think about, for instance, the signing of treaties between the settlers in North America and, um, for, and the First Nations, right? And so the, this idea that, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century, that now we forgot that these were sovereign nations is a, a part of what Conkle describes as the epistemology of ignorance. Other ways in which is um, racial, the, the racial logic of the nation state affect knowledge has to do with how IR scholarship describes the concept of peace. So just a, a couple of uh, uh, illustrations. So this is a picture from 1914 showing, and the, you know, the question that it asks is, who did it? It's being murdering the peace of Europe. So there you have the peace of Europe, dagger in its heart, and this is pre-World War I. So you know, the question is, you know, was, it the, was it Serbia to blame uh, for its resistance to the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Maybe it's Russia's fault. If you know World War I history, you'll have a sense of the importance of these alliances, right? But the important part right here is that this posits that there was a peace prior to 1914 that was then killed by something that somebody in Europe did. Um, if you look at um, Hans Morgenthau, so an IR scholar writing about pre-World War I Europe, he said, quote, the concert of Europe was most successful in preserving general peace during the 90 years of its existence. Now, the important part of this is that canonically, because IR scholarship focuses on peace as something that occurs between sovereign nation states, that um, what this means is that um, uh, violence outside of the European civili uh, civilized area was made invisible and no longer important. And uh, we see this in the description of the world prior to World War I, right, when um, Africa was held under colonialism, as was um, uh, uh, the Caribbean, as was, um, you know, uh, Latin America, as were parts of Asia. And these were, but these were not counted as part of the quote unquote peace in canonical IR or, or the violence within that, um, that, that imposition was not counted as undermining what they consider the quote unquote general peace, right? 
Um, Post-World War II, another scholar has said that, quote, since 1945, the world has been stable and the world of major power is remarkably peaceful, right? Again, in a period of colonialism. And um, Keynes and others describe the pre-1914 world as constituting the, quote, economic consequences of peace. Um, so again, this idea of peace in the canon is constituted around a willful blindness of the people who we now consider to be non-white. Um, finally, these political ideas about non-white citizenship um, have been globalized through the spread of cultural ideas. Oh, uh, this is a, a, a contemporary example of how violence in non-white areas is made normal or invisible, right? So here we have uh, someone writing about the war in Ukraine and saying very explicitly, war, um, what makes war in Ukraine so shocking is that war is no longer something visited upon impoverished nations. It can happen to anyone and that Vladimir Putin's invasion is an attack on civilization itself, right? But you know, of course, by looking at um, 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 violence in the third world that in fact, there is, there's a lot of violence taking place against people of color uh, internationally, but somehow this particular form of violence is seen as, as shocking and those others made or uh, normalized. Uh, so ideas about black citizenship or non-white citizenship are not just in um, uh, international relations theory, but are also embedded embodied or embedded in cultural products. So um, Chinwa Thelwell wrote this really good book called Exporting Jim Crow, in which he traces the export of America's first um, cultural product, right? Or, or America's first cultural export, which was blackface and minstrelsy, part of which was, of course, um, um, uh, physical performance, but also embedded in musical production, what, uh, what Du Bois calls coon songs. And what Thelwell points out is that embedded in these depictions of Black people are ideas about the, the value of Black political citizenship, right? And, um, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with Jim Crow and racist ideas, you know that these entail things like narratives about Black savagery, licentiousness, um, you know, uh, lack of knowledge, um, lack of civilization, and so on, right? And that Jim Crow and the performance of Jim Crow were not restricted to the United States, but were in fact um, exported through uh, 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 traveling performers who went to the United Kingdom, UK colonies, South Africa, Australia, and these performances were popular because they fit with the racial political hierarchy in those countries. And to get to music, we see some of these same ideas about black citizenship and the white racial frame in understanding, in thinking about how, how musical composition and musical knowledge is thought. So this guy right here is Heinrich Schenker, who was a German musical theorist and who believed that music theory or, or argued that the development of music theory was linked inextricably to ideas about race and politics. Now, Schenker developed a method of understanding and analyzing music, which is now taught in music schools as the Schenkerian method. Um, it's not super important to, to be able to do the Schenkerian method to understand it, but the general framework is Schenker studied the melodic and harmonic choices of German composers, um, developed a framework of, of explaining these harmonic choices to talk about how they relate to a broader structure of music, analyzing the tonal center of songs and so on, and, um, and, and use this method to explain uh, different um, harmonic relationships. That's fine, and it, is, it does serve a purpose. The problem with Schenker, however, is that this musical analysis that he developed, um, uh, which was based on the, 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 the choice of German composers, um, Schenker believed illustrated the right forms of musical composition because of his ideas about the ethno-nationalist superiority of German people. And then Schenker applying Schenkerian analysis to non-German traditional forms or non-German musical forms would say, look, these forms are not German and therefore they are wrong or degenerate or problematic, right? And 
uh, and as he said in 1921, the, the, the cultural superiority of German music was linked to the political superiority of the German nation. And so he has this quote in The Mission of German Genius, where he says, no Anglo-Saxon, French, or Italian mother could ever carry in her womb a Bach, a Mozart, a Goethe, a Kant, of all the nations living on the earth today, the German nation alone possesses true genius. So very explicitly there, linking German musical production to German national uh, and political might, right? In 1921, you know, we're having the rise of German nationalism post the Versailles Treaty. Now, these ideas, again, we see about, um, you know, the superiority of white music is being contrasted with the inferiority of black music, which again is tied to ideas about black cultural citizenship. So in 1935, um, Riefle of the British Union of Fascists um, formed a string quartet to perform class, quote unquote classical music. And as he said in the Black Shirt uh, magazine, this pamphlet that he distributed, that the music of the string quartet was an escape from, and he uses a slur for Jewish, Jewish people, um, wailing jazz and gold tooth niggers disseminating the culture of the jungle and the swamp. So again, you know, jazz as a black music, identified as a black music, as part of the quote unquote culture of savagery, right? The jungle and the swamp. And in 1934, again, saying that classical music's quote, beautiful melodies should replace quote, this degrading Negroid cacophony, all right? So to, to kind of sum up, what we see there is the production of knowledge in political theory and in cultural reproduction is tied to ideas about citizenship and also tied to the production of violence, right? So these things are all part of you know, colonialism, uh, Jim Crow uh, 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 politics in the United States, emergence of apartheid in South Africa and so on, right? Um, now, these did not develop without some pushback from non-white people, right? So at the same time that canonical international relations theory was being developed in the late 19th and early 20th century, we also see the emergence of a transnational network of scholar activists from the Pan-African Pan diaspora developing ideas about Black citizenship tied to ideas about music to push back against this white racial frame in, in those other uh, musical forms. And without going too much into history, these ideas were developed uh, um, in eight, starting in 1897 with a Trinidadian lawyer who was living in London who formed the African Association which then later inspired the NAACP by Du Bois and the UNIA by Garvey. And um, in 1900, uh, uh, Williams, who was the lawyer uh, for, or had the first Pan-African conference in London uh, that was attended by not just um, uh, uh, British people, but also people from the Caribbean and the United States, including Booker T. Washington. After World War I, uh, du Bois led the first Pan-African Congress in 1919, and that was kind of the start of this emergence of Pan-African uh, theory. So the short version of Pan-African theory is that it, it developed by focusing and centering the concerns of prim primarily Black um, uh, and uh, Pan-African people, people for, of African descent, in understanding international relations in ways that challenge the ideas and the white racial frame of canonical IR theory. And so just as a quick um, acknowledgement, there's a lot of difference in Pan-African philosophy about um, some ideas, for example, what black emancipation looks like, the importance of repatriation. So it's not monolithic, but Pan-Africanism as it developed in 1900 on through the 1960s does have some important um, things in, in, in common. So one of which is um, it, it counters the idea that the imposition of the nation state was a rational and progressive development of modernity, but rather pointed out that the imposition of the nation state was through a product of violence and savagery. And so Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folks says, quote, war, murder, slavery, extermination, and debauchery 
has been the result of carrying civilization to the Isles of the Sea. Amil, uh, Amilcar Cabral said something very similar in 1974, uh, if anyone's familiar with Cabral. In contrast to the idea that the economic integration of Europe and North America prior to World War I was something which drove peace on the continent, as other as Ayer scholars and contemporary um, analysts wrote, um, they also pointed out that this economic growth was made possible again through racial violence. So CLR James wrote The Black Jacobins in 1938, where he says, quote, the slave trade and slavery were wo woven tight into the economics of the 18th century. Three forces, uh, the proprietor of San Domingo, the French bourgeoisie, the British bourgeoisie, throve on the devastation of a continent and on the brutal exploitation of millions. They also pointed out that the idea of liberalism and democracy, which emerged in IR theory and in uh, narratives about Western enlightenment, um, were constituted in ways that, again, made the experience of non-white people invisible. So Roger Mason, 1944, after a speech by Winston Churchill about the importance of democracy, you know, the war bringing, bringing democracy to the world, um, while Europe was maintaining its colonial possessions, Roger Mace wrote, this, artic wrote this, um, uh, this brief article for which he was jailed, in which he said, very sarcastically, right, that what we are fighting for in world, you know, in world War II is that England might retain her exclusive prerogative to the conquest and enslavement of other nations, that the sun may never set upon the great British tradition of democracy, which chains men and women and little children in gold mines and which relegates all niggers of whichever race to their proper place in the scheme of political economy. And uh, finally, they pointed out that Whereas traditional IR sees peace and security as something that is constituted by interactions between states, they argue that peace and security, particularly for people of, of Black descent, is something that is globally constituted and globally determined across national borders and not something that is mediated by states. So Marcus Garvey in 1930, for instance, said, quote, I know of no national boundary where the Negro is concerned. The whole world is my province until Africa is free. And now, what, what, I, what I find very important to highlight is that these ideas of Pan-Africanism emerged around ideas about Black music um, as a form of building knowledge, in much the same way that ideas about classical music from Schenker and others emerge as part of a racial frame that was embedded in ideas about politics that justified white um, intellectual and political uh, uh, hegemony, right? It's kind of a mirroring of the same process, okay? And so we can see in the writings of Pan-African uh, Pan scholars, consistent attention to the role that music plays uh, and played in the Black Power movement. So Du Bois, for instance, in 1903 wrote about, you know, he has this chapter on sorrow songs in which he speaks about the importance of sorrow songs in that they quote, tell in word and music of trouble and exile, of strife and hiding. In 1900, at the first Pan-African con Congress, which I mentioned earlier, some of the invitees included the Fisk Jubilee Singers, and a Black composer called Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Yes, named after Samuel Coleridge. Um, Samuel Coleridge Taylor was a composer who used African melodies and harmonic choices you know, coming from the African um, spiritual, tradition, uh, spiritual tradition to write musicals, um, including Song of Hiawatha, right? And, um, and over, uh, the Toussaint, Toussaint Louverture, right? Uh, a... Uh, a um, a musical piece about Toussaint Louverture, right? And um, Andrew Hillier of the NAACP wrote a, a little bit after 1900, a letter to, um, to Coleridge Taylor, pointing out that the composition of music that centered black uh, musical choices played an important part in supporting the movement of, of black emancipation and the work of the NAACP. And this echoes more recent writings by Walter Rodney and by Amilcar Cabral on the importance of music and cultural reproduction as well. In the Anglo-Caribbean, the primary connection between 
musical production and political thought has been through the Rastafarian movement. So the founder of Rastafarianism, um, which has a very strong musical connection to reggae music, some of which you heard earlier, um, is through Leonard Howell, who is the has been identified as the very first Rastafarian. So that's him right there in the middle. So this is around like in the 1920s, and that's Marcus Scarfi right beside it, right? So first, um, Marcus Scarfi, like other Pan-African scholars, including Eric Williams, of Trinidad, and then later um, uh, Walter Rodney of Guyana, who you know did something very similar in Jamaica. Uh, Marcus Garvey and Pan-Africanists were very insistent that their writings and ideas would be made accessible and disseminated to the mass public and not just in the halls of academia. And so some of the mass public followers, including Leonard Howell, who went to Garvey's speeches, read Garvey's work, incorporated these in their anti-colonial movements. And so Leonard Howell, you know, didn't just found Rastafarianism, he was also a labor rights activist and anti-colonial agitator for which he was jailed throughout the 1930s. And as the Rastafarian movement became constituted in the 1930s, they got involved in the Caribbean with Garvey's um, uh, organization, the UNIA, in anti-imperialist uh, labor uh, protests. And um, in 1938, there was a series of, um, of uh, protests in the Caribbean that the, the Rastafarians were so heavily involved in that one judge writing on it in 1938 said that these things showed the quote, undoubted nuisance the Rastafari people were becoming. So what we see taking place is that um, with the dissemination of thought by Garvey Williams and then later Malcolm X and then later Walter Rodney, we see the ideas of Pan-Africanism being disseminated to the mass public that then um, is interpreted through music because of the tradition of the West African griot in these, these Black communities, um, which is made necessary by a lack of... Let's go back here. A lack of access to the traditional halls of knowledge by, um, by, by marginalized Black people. And so the, the, the mass public, in particular the Rastafarians, became so um, politicized that in the 1960s, when Walter Rodney, a major Pan-African uh, scholar, when he traveled to Jamaica, and um, had what he called groundings, which were essentially mass teachings with um, uh, unemployed people, the, the poor working class, Rastafarians, and so on. He would hold these groundings while he was teaching at the University of West Indies to speak about political theory. And later in reflecting on these groundings, he wrote in, in Groundings with My Brothers that, quote, I got knowledge from them, real knowledge. You have to speak to the Jamaican Rasta, and then you will hear him tell you about the word. You have to listen to their drums to get the message of the cosmic power. And so what Rodney is doing there is recognizing that by the 1960s, the Rastafarians had incorporated Pan-African theory and were disseminating it through music as a form of building political knowledge. And then later in an unpublished interview, again, he speaks about the importance of art and culture in, 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 in which he said, quote, artistic production is a social process. And um, after... After um, Rodney was exiled in 1968, um, a group of scholars from the University of the West Indies created this journal called Abeng, in which they would reproduce Walter Rodney's writings, Marcus Garvey's writings, and disseminate it to the mass public, as well as having reflections on police brutality and the international economy by Rastafarians who, you know, again, were still being discriminated against. Uh, politically and economically in Jamaica. So again, this was another form of producing knowledge with you know, this, this musical tradition in Rastafarianism. And so finally, we can get to the music, right? And so what you see, if you look at Rastafarianism, look at that one minute ahead. Perfect. Okay. So if you look at the music of Rastafarianism, right, you will see very clear connections to Pan-African theory in a variety of ways. And these include explicit references and quotes of writings and speeches by Pan-African theorists. So some of you may be familiar with a song, Redemption Song by Bob Marley, 
in which he says, um, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, right? None but ourselves can free our mind. That comes from a speech by Marcus Garvey, right? Um, not only do we see explicit, you know, uh, uh, quotations and references, we also see in the music kind of general references to the importance of um, of, of Pan-African scholars. So after Walter Rodney was assassinated in Guyana, um, this artist, Louis Lepke, wrote a song about Walter Rodney called Walter Rodney, in which you know, he references not just Walter Rodney, but also Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, and of course, Marcus Scarvey. I'll play a brief part of that right here, and you can just like listen to the lyrics right here. Well, this is a tribute to the great Dr. Walter Rodney from my man Lou Lepke. Why right now I'm killing earth, Mr. Badley? It have to go down in a history. Me come to tell you about the great Walter Rodney. Hear me now. Me say them kill Walter Rodney. All right, you know, me say this. All right. Um... I'm not going to play all of the songs, you know, obviously in the interest of time, right? We also see um, in this music skepticism as, you know, as, as emerged in Pan-African thought about formal education and formal, you know, canonical representations of culture, which um, this music, like the Pan-Africanists, describe as whitewashing history and promoting the white racial frame. So here we have Bob Marley speaking about or singing about the Babylon system, which is kind of a hegemonic idea about knowledge production. And the lyrics, as you listen to the song, try to read the lyrics as well, which speak about um, the, the, the inclusion of political power with um, the production of knowledge. Just want to be clear, you're hearing the music all right, right? Okay, I, I, I hope that's a yes. All right, okay. Um, another thing to point out is that um, Pan-Africanists, uh, uh, the, the rebel music tradition, like Pan-Africanist theory, um, explicitly links Jamaican Black identity with the broader identity of the Black diaspora, right? So much in the same way that Marcus Scarfi sees, you know, a Black political destiny in the United States or the Caribbean as connected to the liberation of the African continent. So we see in contemporary music, as Janine uh, uh, sings about here, that um, that uh, Jamaican Black identity is part of the identity of Africanness from on the African continent. So, you know, she has this thing right here, is that one thing to overstand, which, you know, you would translate as understand, one thing to understand about Jamaica is that Jamaica is the confidence of the African continent in Rastafari. So I'll play that clip right here. Love in the yard, St. Andrew Park Music a bubble, steam as a bubble Fun chalice a bubble From morning to dark And the fire upon the flower just a blaze up One thing to over us about Jamaica We are the confidence of the African continent In our Rastafari No influence is greater And the state of the nation is testament to why Madonna is the 
another thing to point out is that, again, in thinking about ways that narratives of quote unquote classical music um, criticize the musical choices of quote unquote black music, right? And so again, you know, going back to earlier slides, you see um, narratives of jazz as being a um, what was it? A, a degraded Negro cacophony, right? And you know, of course, if you want to extend that that language to the um, contemporary world, I'm sure many of you are familiar with ways in which people speak about hip hop and rap contemporarily, right? Um, as you know, as uh, rap is just crap without the C, or it's not real music. Um, ben Shapiro, right, has a very has a bunch of videos in which he says that rap isn't real music, right? Again, part of that same tradition of um, of linking black citizenship to, uh, to to black musical choices. So in rebel music, we see um, the the conscious choice of particular musical forms and musical motifs as representing blackness and as speaking truth to or challenging power, right? So in the song, uh, Keta Drum by Beanie Man and, and Determine, what they're singing about here is that the use of African drumming rhythms and this kind of African tradition, the use of this drum is an important part of challenging the cultural hegemony of whiteness. And so Rome in this, in this part right here is kind of a, a symbol of global um, uh, uh, white authority, right? And um, where the, 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 the Catholic Church is kind of a stand-in for, 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 uh, for white hegemony, right? And so what we see them singing right here is that beating the kettle drum, right? The very sound of the drum, the African tradition itself um, is going to be used to burn down Rome or challenge um, white hegemony and quote-unquote make Pope Paul frown. So we'll hear a little bit of that right here. While I'm violent, please sing along. Oh, make your music, please. Oh, so. Get that jump, get that jump, make me hear a sound. Get that jump, get that jump, make me run down road. Get that jump, get that jump, make me hear a sound. Shake it, tambourine, and make it go ball frown. Get that jump, get that jump, make me hear a sound. Tell me what them are going to do to move up my crown. Get that jump, get that jump, make me hear a rebound. And the music where we love, and on the coffee we hold. When the music hits, when the music hits, spread out your feel no pain, no pain at all. But all it do, it sterilize the body and you hot your mind and it memorize the brain. But you me feel, when the enemy man a chant, determine a chant, for the youth them down the lane, go to the moon, put down the gun and I'll stop the coat to you, them brain from the lane in vain. All right, and then finally, um, in much the same way that Pan-Africanists have criticized the concept of peace that canonical IR theory has presented, and you know, I spoke about how canonical IR theory would described um, the world before World War I as embodying peace, described the world after World War II as constituting peace, despite the fact that those periods were characterized by colonialism and colonial suppression, so too we see those same ideas in Pan-African music, in rebel music, for example, in the song by Peter Tosh on um, equal rights, in which he says very explicitly that um, he doesn't want peace, right? This, this hegemonic idea of peace, but what he wants is equal rights and justice, right? <laughs>
right? So very clearly right there, what he's doing is questioning the idea of a peace or, or you know, this idea of order that is built upon a foundation of injustice in much the same way that Roger Mace was pointing out that British ideas of peace and democracy were being propounded at the same time that Britain was maintaining its colonial possessions. Oh, it keeps doing this. All right. So the takeaway from all of this, right, is that um, the production of knowledge, something, again, that I want to highlight, right, is that the, the, the production of knowledge and what we, we consider canonical knowledge is embodied or embedded in colonial power structures, okay? Um, and that canonical IR, what if, if anyone has taken a, an IR course, right, like intro to IR or whatever, right, that the, the canon of the field, okay, much like all the forms of knowledge, is produced under a white racial frame, and this white racial frame has also underlied cultural production in canonical music theory, and that these racial frames in culture and music and in political thought were also tied to the production of political violence, like real world political violence against people who are now racialized as non-white, right? I've been focusing on the African diaspora, but you know you can extend this, um, this discussion to uh, uh, ideas about you know, um, the subjugation of First Nations people, uh, Asian people, indigenous people in Latin America and so on, right? I'm just focusing on the African diaspora because it's what I'm doing research on. Uh, second, Pan-African resistance to this colonialist logic did not only take place in the African thought of Du Bois and uh, you know, Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey and C.L.R. James and Eric Williams, but also took place in the cultural realm as rebel music, for example, in the Afro-Caribbean embodied some of these ideas and produced knowledge about them and spoke truth to power through musical performance. And importantly, that these, this, this musical performance and this, this, these cultural narratives are linked to the production of knowledge in the political sphere in much the same way that Schenker's ideas about ethno-nationalist superiority of Germans and the British fascist ideas about classical music versus jazz music were linked to the production of knowledge about civilization and, and, and political science, right? And that if we, the bigger question is, if we want to decolonize the curriculum or decolonize knowledge, as some people have pointed out, that we need to pay attention not just to um, uh, 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 academic forms of knowledge, but also ways in which knowledge is produced in cultural reproductions outside of the academy. And just as a final thing, and this is probably going to work better for people who are recording it, here's a list of, um, of recommended readings. If anyone wants to take a screenshot, you can look at these for further readings on, on, on this topic. Some of the material that I've used here uh, came from interviews and from archival research, which you're not going to have access to, okay? But you can, you know, certainly look at these and, and, and get a, a sense of what I'm talking about. All right, so that is it for my presentation. And I will take a look at the, or we'll get to the Q&A questions in the chat. I see there's 11, probably won't get to all of them, but we'll do what we can. If folks have questions, if you can drop them into chat, um, then we'll, uh, we'll try to answer them. I, I have a, a question for you or perhaps ask for, for a reflection. Um, you know, to, to talk about Bob Marley, uh, who's sort of the, you know, he's behind you there and probably the, the most popular uh, person that, that some folks, myself included, think of. Um, you know, I, you could see him as really a symbol for all oppressed people. As you said, toward the end, I remember seeing Bob Marley posters on Indian reservations that I visited. Um, but at the same time, he's also, he's wildly popular in a dominant culture. I remember a Red Sox player having Three Little Birds as his walk-up song when he came to bat. And I was just curious, you know, your thoughts about that in terms of Marley in particular having becoming so popular that he's eclipsed. Um, like I, I heard of Marcus Garvey, but I never heard of Leonard Howe. So, you know, and I really appreciate you uh, 
pulling out that lyric from Redemption Song, I had no idea the origin of that. So I'm just curious your thoughts about Bob Marley, not just in, in his relationship to oppressed people, but relationship to like a global superstar for that many people claim. Yeah, so this is kind of the, uh, I don't want to say like challenging, but kind of the downfall thing or the downfall of cultural production in a capitalist system, right? Which is that, um, you know, Bob Marley, like all the musicians, um, you know, wants to have a wide audience, right? And the production of music, um, once it becomes commercialized, gets tied to these other power structures, right? And the, the, the difficulty with that is that... Um, there's always a danger and the possibility that cultural forms that challenge a hegemony can become almost co-opted and, uh, for lack of a better word, um, neutralized or, or defanged, okay? And so, um, and the, the process by which this takes place is, um, you know, varies across cases, but what usually happens is that, um, you know, uh, segments of the dominant culture will, for example, like focus on the, the rhythm of the songs or the music of the songs rather than content, or they might be completely unaware of it, or certain songs might become, you know, more popular than others. Three Little Birds, great song, right? Bob Marley also wrote, you know, uh, love songs, okay, as, you know, have some of these other musicians. Um, you know, not everybody's writing all politics all the time, right, unless you're Rage Against the Machine. But there's always a possibility that, you know, that, that this music will be co-opted. Now, it's not something that's limited only to Bob Marley, right? So a famous example in the United States is Bruce Springsteen and the song um, Born in the USA, right? That's a song that is, you know, critical of war, critical of, you know, the, the, the military industrial complex, you know, questioning this idea of jingoism. And it's meant to be, you know, kind of sarcastic. But... You know, throughout the 1980s was used and, you know, into the Trump era, right, was used by uh, politicians, um, you know, uh, campaigning for the presidency um, who uh, embodied a foreign policy message completely in opposition to Bruce Springsteen, but would play that part of the song, you know, born in the USA, because it sounds super patriotic, right? Um, another interesting thing is that, you know, the image of the Rastafarian in Jamaica has been tied very strongly, speaking of commercialism, to the tourist market, right? And so something that's very interesting for me or has been very interesting to me as a Jamaican is coming to the United States and seeing how Americans have historically understood Rastafarians, right? Now, Rastafarians in Jamaica, right, and not just in Jamaica, have been very politically active, sometimes very militant and very critical of the dominant structure involved in the labor rights, you know, throughout the 1930s, um, participated in the revolution in Grenada, right, to install a socialist government, um, harassed by the state, by, by the um, uh, colonial state, you know, uh, while Jamaica was uh, in, um, under British rule, harassed and, you know, terrorized by the state after the 1960s, seen as persona non grata. Their musical instruments were destroyed by police raids, you know, 1960s, 1980s. I mean, they have been a very political and politically targeted community, right? But then I come to America, and then the image of the Rastafarian is like, oh, it's, you know, kind of like this happy-go-lucky person who's like smoking weed and chilling and yama and everything, Ari complete opposition to what the Rastafarian actually was in Jamaica. So the problem with Bob Marley, I mean, it's not exactly his fault, but his image, you know, kind of fit in with these broader markets. So, you know, that, that, that is part of why, you know, people, you know, that, that would have been opposition, opposition to Bob Marley's message will play his music. So, yeah, it's a good, good question. Uh, let's see. There's a question here from Allison. She says, yeah. "Thank you, thank you for your insights. Have you created a dedicated playlist of rebel music you can share?" I actually do have a playlist. I have a bunch of playlists. So um, I have one. Well, I had one in Spotify, and then I deleted Spotify because of the Joe Rogan thing. Um, but I do have one on Tidal. I don't know if anyone has a Tidal account. 
but you know, if you send a request, it's going to take a little bit of time to kind of pull it up. But yes, I do have a, a bunch of good playlists on, on Tidal. So yeah. Would there be some specific artists that you would recommend that people search out? Yeah, so obviously, you know, Bob Marley is a classic. A lot of people know him. Um, Peter Tosh, right, a former whaler, would be another great one. Um, uh, Burning Spear, who we were playing earlier. And then there's also kind of contemporary musicians as well. Janine, who was, you know, one of my interview subjects. She's one of my favorite. Um, Kabaka Pyramid. Uh, maybe I should, like, put these. Let me just type them in the... And then type them in the chat because no one will have any idea who I'm talking about. So if you want to get a good sense of rebel music, I would check out these guys uh, uh, among others. I mean, you know, it's, it's an entire musical tradition, so I'm not going to be able to do everyone, but these are more um, contemporary performers. Um, you know, if you want to add to, you know, kind of the classics that most people think of when they think about reggae. Let's see. We have a, Question, are you a musician yourself? Um, I, I am <laughs> not a very good one, <laughs> um, but I played the trumpet. So my band was here earlier. The band that I played was here earlier. I don't know if they're still on. Um, and I also play guitar, you know, also like not, not super well. But yeah, I, I, I do like music, right? Oh, um, one thing that I want to point out, right? So I mentioned Shankarian analysis and I mentioned canonical IR, right? Um, so there's nothing wrong with Shankaran an analysis per se. Okay. And so musicologists have pointed out, including Philip Ewell, who I mentioned earlier, pointed out that Shankaran analysis is very useful for understanding and comparing certain forms of music, right? The problem with Shankaran analysis and the problem with canonical IR and the problem with the white racial frame in general is that it posits that this particular form of knowledge is the best or the only form of understanding whatever feel is being applied to, you know, music or political thought or, you know, art or, or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that is where it, it, um, it goes right, right? Because, you know, I, I don't want people to say, oh, you know, uh, Kami doesn't like classical music. I think classical music is fine. I love playing classical music, right? Um, but we have to be careful about how or understanding of what constitutes good music or good thought um, is constituted in ways that marginalize or disenfranchise other forms of knowledge um, uh, just because we're not familiar with them, so to speak. If folks have any any other questions, please uh, type them in. I, I have a reflection or, or a question. I'll see if I can articulate it. Um, okay. You know, I, you know, being a middle-aged white guy who grew up in a rural area, um, you know, I remember when rap music became, you know, came to the awareness of the dominant white culture in the, in the early 80s and some of the things that were mentioned there in the 1930s and were brought out uh, licentiousness, you know, dangerous, thuggish. Um, and now, and, and at the time, you know, sort of somewhat ironically, you know, rock music was the, the dot, which is inherently a black art form or marriage of several black art forms was the dominant, you know, popular music of, of the time. You know, rap music is completely culturally dominant uh in in north american culture and perhaps even global culture and i'm just curious your thoughts about that you know those critiques still and stereotypes still seem to remain even mm -hmm. though you know um you know i might i have a 20 year old daughter and uh you know her friends listen <laughs> uh listen to kendrick lamar you know here in in rural vermont uh and so i'm curious you know are some of those stereotypes and some of that thinking brought on partially because it now is the dominant form? Yeah, I mean, the, music. yeah, I think the it's, it's almost like a conundrum for musicians in Black musical art forms, right? In that, you know, again, to go back to the song Ketadrum, 
right? Um, by being a man and determined, right? Um, the a lot of these musical choices, right, are made kind of very deliberately to emphasize black identity, right? By using, you know, motifs or, you know, instruments or forms that are linked with blackness, okay? Um, where that becomes kind of a double-edged sword is that sometimes the dominant culture, you know, adopts this or like disseminates this as proof of the degeneracy of black culture, right? So rap music, for instance, right? You know, you have a lot of rappers, you know, Public Enemy, Kendrick Lamar, okay? Um, you know, um, uh, Vic, um, Vic Mensa, right? Who, you know, are kind of politically engaged. Dead Press would be another one, right? Who are politically engaged. Um, but, you know, the music is still kind of held up as, you know, um, you know, black culture is, you know, fat or thuggish or degenerate or what have you. And same with that rap uh, uh, jazz historically, right, in the 1930s, because of the different rhythmic choices, the use of syncopation, the different harmonic and melodic choices, right, was then used by people to say, this is proof of Black degeneracy, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of a double-edged sword in that the same techniques that have been used to um, celebrate Black culture have also been used to denigrate Black culture by the dominant um, uh, um, um, by the dominant culture, and very interestingly, right? Like the, the the jazz thing, I find so fascinating because again, if you look, you know, early twentieth century, right? Jazz was proof of degenerate Negroid cacophony or whatever, right? And now. You know, people study jazz as like, oh, you know, music theory and, you know, the, the relation of the dominant to the subdominant or whatever. Right. And rap now occupies the same place that jazz did in the 1930s. But jazz has now become, you know, uh, like like white acceptable, I suppose. All right. So Betsy asked the question, how did I become interested in the subject? Yeah. So this is this kind of like a, a, a cir circuitous um, way, right? So what I would trace this to was being in um, teaching at an institution before I came to um, uh, Middlebury. And one of the things that was being discussed, so I went to this talk by a prominent canonical IR scholar who was speaking about world peace, right? And the construction of world peace. And so, you know, the question was, how could America retain its dominance in the post-Cold War era to ensure, you know, the continuation of world peace, right? Like, how would we have world peace in, in a world that was becoming more, more multipolar? And I remember sitting in this room and seeing all of, I was the only Black person in this room, and seeing all of these scholars um, kind of as, taking it for granted that American hegemony was necessarily peaceful for you know, everyone else in the world, right? And I remember thinking to myself about, you know, Vietnam and, you know, interventions in Latin America and, you know, the support of Pinochet and just being flabbergasted that the experience of non-white people were being left out of this image of peace. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, just being like very depressed and then going and listening to, you know, reggae music and, getting into, um, you know, kind of the messages of, uh, you know, Burning Spear and Bob Marley and Bound to Killer and, you know, Beanie Man as kind of a form of solace to what I was experiencing as a very alienating experience in academia. And, you know, from then, you know, uh, um, just getting interested in the history of the, of the political thought of the music. So that's, that's kind of it. I got into it as an IR scholar and an amateur musician, I suppose.